Okay, uh, we are continuing our study in this book of Revelation. We are in lesson number nine, which is chapter 14, 15, and 16. And uh, we kind of, the week before when I uh, kicked off this particular lesson, we looked at um, kind of an overview of the whole thing, kind of went into understanding the Lamb and the 144,000 that are with Him. And uh, Brother Thampi last Sunday uh, really focused on the gospel, the eternal gospel, and I think it was uh, pretty clarified in terms of what uh, gospel is being preached, because we understand that, you know, there is no other gospel, there is no other way in which man through the centuries from beginning till the end can come to Christ. There is no other way other than Jesus Christ and His atoning work. That is the only way in which a human being can come to the presence of God. And the moment we start dividing it up into various ways, we are opening ourselves to a lot of heresies. So it, is, it should be very clear in our mindset, it should be very clear in our understanding that from the beginning to the end, there is no other way in which a man can come to God, and that is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is the only gospel, that there is this, this gospel that is preached may point to different things, point to various aspects, and a very good study I would really um, recommend would be the book of Acts. So if you really want to understand that, go to the book of Acts and look at the messages that were given. Look at Peter's message to the people who were gathered in the city of Jerusalem, right? And then look at Paul's message uh, to the people of Athens, and you would see how God's message, the gospel is the same, but how it is presented focuses people to various things, right? So I'd leave it at that. I think it was very well covered last Sunday. Um, and we are now moving on as we uh, move on this uh, chapter. My, uh, my uh, hope today is to finish up this lesson and then get to the questions at the end. If you don't get to the questions, please do, please do so, and then we can uh, refer back to these questions, go through the answers next Sunday. Okay? So in chapter 17, I'm, I'm sorry, in chapter 14, so chapter 12 to chapter 14 is what we can call as kind of a, a parenthesis or an intermission or whatever you may call it, something that is not moving in a chronological order. And when you come to chapter 15 is when the chronological order resumes. So, so we can look in chapter 11, right? In chapter 11, the seventh trumpet sounds and in the seventh trumpet is contained the finality of what God is doing on this earth. And that is what we read in, in chapter 11, verse 15, right? Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdom of kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ, and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. So there is this announcement made at the seventh trumpet that it is done. This whole plan, this whole uh, time of tribulation, all that has now come, and now it is time for Christ to come to earth, okay? But then when we look at chapter 12, you can see there is some sort of a parenthesis. There is something that is being shown to John, and what he is seeing really is not the next event, but he is being shown a sign. He looks at different things. He looks at various events that have happened that are happening at that time. He gets a vision all the way from the beginning where uh, Israel brings forth Christ and how Christ is taken up to the heavens and all those kind of things. So he kind of sees this whole big grand picture in chapter 12, chapter 13, and in chapter 14. He is looking at events that is happening during the great tribulation, the latter part of the tribulation. Okay? Is that clear? I'm guessing that's clear. Okay. So, now in chapter 14, we saw the 144,000. Just to be clear, these are not the only people who would be saved at this time. 
uh, the only uniqueness of this 144,000 people, and we need to be very clear about it, okay? The only uniqueness of these people, they are Israelites, okay? They are specially selected by God. They are specially selected to be preserved. So they are going to be divinely preserved during the seven-year tribulation period and would enter into the millennium with Christ. That is a special privilege given to these people. They are not selected based on their merit. They are not selected based on something they did, but these have been elected, and we know there are 12,000 from each group. So there is some sort of a math there. There is some sort of a plan there, and these are people from particular tribes. They don't know. Today, Israelite, if you pick up a Jew and, and talk to that person, they won't know what tribe they are from, right? But the Lord knows. So the Lord's going to pick these people up, and he has that planned already. He knows who these people are. When the time comes, these people will be picked, they'll be chosen, they'll be protected, and they will enter the millennium with Christ, okay? So that's the only uniqueness that we know about these people. And then verse 6 onwards, uh, we hear uh, the angels. So you have three angels, and... Um, in verse 6, we read about angel and his gospel, the everlasting gospel. And then in verse 8, we have another uh, angel, the second angel, and the another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So, who is this Babylon, Right? Now, that is a big question. A lot of people have various thoughts about it. So who is Babylon? We don't know. We don't know what form that would take. Now, some have talked about, I think, uh, Brother McDonald talks about a commercial religious system with headquarters in Rome, as he puts it there. We don't know that. Um, we don't know where it's going to be headquartered. We don't know if this is going to be the Roman, um, uh, the Roman church, the Catholic church, we don't know. So the problem is, there are a lot of authors who have written in various times, and I think something that we talked about from the very beginning was, please do not try to interpret the book of Revelation based on current events, because they are not valid, right? So people, uh, there was, you know, when, when the Roman church was a very strong body, when the Roman church was a strong political uh, body when the Pope was literally the king of the world, uh, there were a lot of uh, good meaning, well meaning authors who saw in that system the Antichrist, who saw in that system uh, a Roman, a Rome based um, world empire. Okay? But we have to understand something. We don't know that. And today, if you look at the, the Roman Catholic Church, their influence on the world has diminished quite a bit, right? They really don't have a whole lot of influence going on. Now, you know, there may be in the background some countries, but think about it. They have no influence anywhere east of the Middle East. Nothing, right? And pretty much, I think, what, one out of four people in this world live east of the Middle East? One out of three, I think there's this, this. It's a huge population that lives in that area of the world. So we cannot take these things and we cannot just put it in what we see today. We have to realize that, and another thing that we have to always understand, we say, well, we are seeing the signs of Christ coming and he'll come right now. That's our hope. That's our wish. But that may not fit in God's plan. The reason I'm saying, beloved, is we have to be very careful when we understand scriptures because what happens is when we start looking at world events, when we get bogged up by world events, when we get bogged up by our local events, and we start talking about all these things, we are, we are getting ourselves distracted. From what? We are getting ourselves distracted from our primary and the most important job. And that is to preach the gospel to the people. That is what we have to do, but we get caught up in all these things. 
We are trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. We are trying to figure out who Babylon is and all that stuff. We don't know. Because what we don't know is Christ may not come for the next 500 years. Does anybody here can say, oh, I know for a fact that Christ is coming in the next 50 years? I don't. None of us do. So does anybody know how the world's going to look in 500 years? We don't know. So how can we make these kind of statements to say that, you know, this is talking about this Roman Empire. This is talking about all this. We don't know that. We don't know which would be the world leading country in 500 years. We don't know. I mean, can you imagine the 1700s or the 1800s? Let's go to 1800s when England was ruling the world. If in 1800s somebody would stand up and preach about England being a small island, in 2021, that its influence would be just very local, that they won't be ruling over any countries. Can you imagine? People would have been scorning that statement, right? So they have to be very careful. That's why, beloved, I want to, if there is, as I said, I, I keep saying these things like over and over, and I said, you know, just, I don't expect us to understand the whole book of Revelation, but it is very important for us to keep a few things in our mind. And that is that we need to let the things that are not clear, not clear. And we get excited about things. We want answer to everything. And, and we want to, uh, we, we think we know. But we have to realize God works in a mysterious way. He works in a mysterious way. He has his ways, and he will do it. Let's not get excited about it. So coming back to this thing, okay? So we don't know. We don't know what it is going to be. I don't know, and I don't think anybody can absolutely sh say that, yeah, this is going to be the Roman uh, Empire coming back. It's going to be a world empire. I think we talked about it, you know, when we looked at the four different animals and we looked at how they were representing four different ways in which um, man had tried to govern himself, right? We talked about those, right? And, and in those things is basically defined every way in which man has tried to overthrow God and to uh, take care of himself, okay? Then the third angel, verse, uh, verse 9 to 13. Then the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which has poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So here is the third angel giving this big, uh, sounding out this big warning and telling the people about what's going to happen, okay? So, the lamb appears, okay? The Israelites, as a nation, have been deceived, and then they recognize, right in the middle of this tribulation period, when the Antichrist puts his own image in, 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 in the temple, and people have been deceived, they understand that they have been deceived, and they recognize that, and there is the severe persecution of the Jews at that time. The nations have gathered to completely destroy the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. The nations have gathered to themselves up. There is a war or, or a threatening of war. We, we all kind of know. Now, as I said, we should not be... Um, we should not be... Uh, interpreting the scriptures based on current events, but we can get an idea of what it would look like, right? Since past few weeks, we've been talking about how Russia is stationed itself before Ukraine, and you can see pretty much every day some world leader is sounding out an alarm that Russia would invade any day, right? So think about that picture, but blow it up like 2,000 times. And now think about all the nations gathered in front of Jerusalem and in, in, in the borders of Israel, and ready at any moment to invade. So that is going to be the situation. Every newscaster is going to be fixated on this particular thing that Israel is going to be invaded any moment. 
and the nations and the leader have gathered themselves, right? And that is the very moment when the Lamb comes onto Mount Zion, when the true Messiah comes down, and he is now ready to fight. How do we know all that? Let's go back to the book of, uh, let's first go, I think Brother Thumpy referred to it already, so I won't spend too much time, uh, but in the book of Matthew and 24, Christ talks about it, and then we'll go further back into the uh, prophecies. So in Matthew chapter 24, um, in verse 29, okay? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the star will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You can go to Luke 21, you can go to Mark 13, and all these three talk about pretty much the same event. Here are the words of Christ talking about how as the tribulation period comes to a close, Christ will appear. And the whole world is going to, including Israel, is going to look. Okay? And then what happens? Let's go to the book of um, Joel. Um, Joel and chapter 3. And I'll read a few verses from there. Uh, verse 1 onwards, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, now this is not talking about bringing back the captives after their first uh, uh, imprisonment, so to say, when they were taken by the Babylonians, but this is talking about a latter time. When I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. So there you go. You can see that the, the Lord's hand is in there. He is bringing these nations. So the nations are thinking that they are coming to destroy, but there is a grander plan of the Lord being fulfilled here. He brings down these people. Okay, And then uh, I'll jump to verse 12. Let the nations be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Now, pay attention to verse 13. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark. The star will diminish with brightness. Remember the words of the, the Lord? as he was talking about pretty much the same events. The Lord will also roar from Zion and utter his voice, the Lamb, utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then Jerusalem shall be holy and no alien shall ever pass through her again. So, you can see what there are, there are two things that are happening. Let's jump to the book of Zechariah 2, real quick. Let's uh, go to Zechariah and chapter 12. And a few verses from there. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1 The burden of the Lord, the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen on that day that I will make Jerusalem very heavy stone for all people. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces through all nations of the earth, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Okay? So here again, he's referring back to that same event of the nations gathered against Jerusalem. Jump to verse 10. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. 
and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning at Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. Now, what is he referring to? He's referring back to the time of Josiah. <laughs> Josiah was killed in the battle of Megiddo against Nebo, the pharaoh. Okay? And, and we'll get to that in a minute. And the land shall mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and the wives by themselves. So here it is. It is a time of surprise for two peoples. Okay? It's a time of surprise for the Israelites because as they are completely surrounded, these people have no way of being rescued. They have lost all hope. They, have, they are hopeless. And at that time, Messiah appears. At that time, Messiah appears, the Lamb, along with his 144,000 on Mount Zion. And he has now gotten all these nations around him to destroy. So that is a time of surprise. When they will look and they will recognize, oh, this is the Christ whom we pierced. This is the same Jesus whom we killed. And they will bow down to him. They will at last recognize that this is the Messiah. And at the same time, the world's going to be surprised because they're going to look at this one leader that pops up and, and they have no idea. And they get completely destroyed. Okay? And that is why I, I said when we were reading in the book of Joel I, and, and we were in verse 13, I said pay attention there because that refers back straight to everything you're going to read in chapter 14, verse 14 to 20. Because there, again, there is a harvest that's being spoken about. There is, um, in verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one, like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and on his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat in the cloud, Thrust your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust a sickle to the earth, on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also, having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar. And I'll jump to verse 19. So the angel thrust a sickle to the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Now everything that the Lord has been talking about to his disciples, and, um, and everything that he's been talking about, uh, you know, about how uh, Satan's going to plant these, um, these wild, uh, that he's going to, if, if you go to, let, let me just go to Matthew chapter 13. Sorry, we're jumping through some verses, but it will all make sense. Matthew 13, and look at, here, here we have the parable, right? The parable of the, uh, the sower and, and tares, how the farmer sows the seed, and there, is, there are tares. And, 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 and when his servants come and say, well, can we just go ahead and pluck everything? He says, no, let it be. When the time comes for harvest, I'll, we'll take the tares out, and then we will... Uh, we will deal with that, okay? And if you go to verse 30 of uh, Matthew chapter 13, for sake of time, I'll quickly read through it. Let both grow together, that is the wheat and the tares, until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn, okay? So now here in the book of Revelation, very much like the book of Joel, we are given two pictures. It's the same phrase that Joel uses that uh, the Lord uses here in the book of Revelation as well, right? In the book of uh, Joel in 3.13, we talk about a sickle uh, for a harvest and then a wine press, right? In both cases, and in, and in the verses in the book of Revelation, we read about the same thing. In both cases, there is two imagery being given. One is the same imagery that Christ uses, talking about the tares and wheat. So here, the, the order is being given. Now is the time. Now we are going to separate, right? So 
the Lord lets the world progress with this mashup, with this world religion, with everything that man has to offer today. See, today a lot of people think they are believers. They think. We, 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 we hear a lot of preachers talk about, oh, well, you know, there's... There's this vast multitude of believers. They are believers. I've got this church, 10,000 people. I've got this other church with 20,000 people. They may not even have 100 people who are believers in that church. We don't know that. See, a lot of people today are thinking and they are being deceived. And it is only going to get worse during the time of tribulation. So think about our times today. It's only going to get worse where people are going to think that they are all believers, that they are all good people, they're all nice people, that they're doing Lord's work. Lord himself prophesied about it. People are going to think that they're doing good by letting their children uh, be pointed out. People are going to think uh, that they're doing good by killing others. These are all things that people are going to do, thinking that they are righteous. And, and what is going to happen as it happens today is the Lord just lets it go till that time till that moment on that Mount Zion, till that chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, when the Lord says, that's it, now let me separate. So he gives us two imagery. One is the tares with the wheat, where Satan has put in the tares with the wheat, and he separates that out. He takes the sickle, the harvest is ready. Take the grain, that is the people who are his own, he will take to himself, and there are people who have to be left here and to suffer his wrath now are there. And at the same time, there is the wine press, where which is talking about the wrath of God. It is an imagery of the overflowing wrath of God. The wrath of God has been growing and growing and growing, and he's been holding back. This morning we were talking about the mercy of God and his loving kindness and his long suffering. All that is going on till the time when he says, that's it. And now... He's going to deal. So what he's saying there in this two imagery in, in, in chapter 14 of the book of Revelation is basically how the time has now come for the Lord to stop and to start his judgment. Okay? And in chapter 15, we look at kind of a quick picture in heaven and he says, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For them, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of Lamb. So there are two songs. You know, People get caught up, okay, is this one song that is authored by two people, the Moses and the Lamb, what is this? Let's, let's not get bogged down. There's two aspects to this thing. Now, in front of the throne, John sees a big multitude. This is this huge group of people who have not taken the mark of the beast, who have been martyred by the beast, who have, been, who have had to suffer because of their refusal to take the mark of the beast. Okay, And because of that, now they are there. And, and from the beginning, from, the, from chapter 4 of the book of Revelation, we keep on seeing this imagery of people who have been persecuted, who are in front of Christ. Right? When the fifth seal is opened, you see this big group of people under the altar. We see these people who are crying out to the Lord, Lord, when are you going to avenge us? Right? And so constantly in these chapters, we see this group of people who are crying out to the Lord. And now this multitude, if you remember in chapter 5, I think, when, when these people cry out to the Lord, the Lord says, well, wait, because there are more people being you know, joined with you. There are, there are more people who are going to be martyred. So wait for that number to be full. And that is what has happened now. The number is full. And these people are crying out. And at their, instead of crying out vengeance, they really are now singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. The song of Moses and song of the Lamb pretty much define um, the song of redemption, right? What was the song of Moses? Now, Moses had a song when they went out of Egypt, when they crossed the Red Sea, there was a song of Moses. I mean, we 
understand that as a song of Miriam, his sister, but actually written by Moses, sung by Miriam. And then in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 32 of the book of Deuteronomy, there is also a song of Moses. So kind of the, in the beginning and in the end, Moses has a song, okay? As Moses is passing away and he gives his last message in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses sings a song. As Moses takes the people out and they cross the ocean, Moses sings a song. Both of these songs are songs of redemption. And at the same time, the song of the Lamb is the, lamb, is the song that we sing as believers. We have a song of redemption. So you can basically think as a picture showing both Jews and Gentiles coming together singing this song. You can also think about all the ages from the beginning to the end coming together in one song. Either way, it is a group of people who have a song of redemption that they are singing and they're, they're talking about how great and marvelous the Lord is and how He is being glorified because... Why? For your judgments have been manifested in verse 4. So now they're excited. These people who have been crying out vengeance, these people who have been crying out to the Lord are now excited because they are now going to witness what the Lord is talking about all these years. He has been talking about His vengeance. He has been warning the people about His vengeance. And now the time has come. And they are now singing out in joy. Okay? And then... After these things, and you can see that the temple of tabernacle was opened and the smoke, in verse 8, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power and no one was able to enter the temple. There's something very important for us to understand here. Temple is the place or tabernacle is the place where mercy was given. It is a picture of mercy, right? A priest going into the holy place was a picture of mercy because man can never approach God only through the blood of the lamb. A man can be covered so that he can approach God. And here now, that approachability has been shut off, meaning that the time of God's mercy to mankind has come to an end. The Lord has closed the door. This, these verses, this chapter, chapter 14, chapter 15, is the time when we look up and we see the time when Lord closes the door. That's it. Going back to the time of Noah as he closed the door of the ark, right? It's the same imagery that we are seeing here as the Lord closes the door. Nobody can come into the temple because the time of mercy, the time of forgiveness is done with. The Lord is now dealing with the nations. He's got them where he wanted them to be. He is in Jerusalem. He is in Mount Zion. The nations have gathered around. And then I'll quickly jump through here. Um, in, um, in chapter 16, you've got the bowls or the vials, you know. Now the Lord, this is basically all coming one after the other in quick successions. And, and the world is totally being destroyed. So loathsome source. And, and a lot of these things go back to, again, how the Lord dealt with the nation of Egypt as He was bringing the Israelites out. So the first one is loathsome sores. People have sores on their body. The second is the sea turns to blood. The water, the world, the world is going to be completely destroyed. We don't know how this is going to happen. We don't know what it is going to look like. But one thing we know, people are going to be severely afflicted. We don't know if they're going to get skin cancer, and we don't know what's going to happen. But we do know is something happens to their body. They are going to be miserable. They're going to look for death, and they won't find it. And then there's no water to drink. All the water of this earth is going to be destroyed. Nobody can drink, and you're thirsty. You're, 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 you've got all sorts of stuff in your body. And at the same time, the sun suddenly becomes much more brighter, right? I mean, all the... Climate people have been warning us. We didn't listen to that. They've been telling us about how that, all this is going to happen. So you have to realize something. That's exactly what people are going to say at that time. They're still not going to look to the Lord. They're still not going to look up and say, oh, the Lord's punishing us, or the Lord is against us. It's not going to happen. 
People are still going to talk about science. People are still going to say, we told you so. We were talking about this time. Why didn't you listen to us? Right? This is what the world is going to say. So that is why, you know, it is, we have to realize one thing. I'm, I'm getting a little sidetracked, but I will, I'll get back to that. We have to realize that people who don't have Christ, who don't believe in the Lord, and us believers, our mindsets are different. See, what we think and how we apply logic in our life is going to be different than unbelievers' logic. So it's many times it's challenging for us because we're like, it's so obvious, why don't you get it, right? Start talking to an atheist or, or start talking to an idol worshiper and you realize, how can you do this? And it just doesn't get, it, it, they, it just doesn't get into their brain. And that's exactly how it's going to happen at that time. Anyway, now go, go to uh, verse 10. You've got the darkness and the pain that people are going to uh, go through. And look at verse 11. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and the source and did not repent of their deeds. Even then, there is no repentance. And then the sixth bowl, Euphrates dries up, right? This big river. What is it symbolizing? It is symbolizing that now there is nothing that is holding back. Euphrates is really that one thing that held, or, or Euphrates has been historically the boundary for Israel. Either way, Abraham crossed the Euphrates to come to Israel, right? Anybody who went that side, when, when they were taken into captivity, they crossed the Euphrates to go the other way, right? The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, all these people who came, they crossed the Euphrates to come. So the drying up, drying up of Euphrates is an imagery given to us to understand that that has been taken away. That boundary has been broken. The nations are now in Israel ready to destroy. Why? Because the Lord has gathered them in verse 16 at this place God called Armageddon. Now what is Armageddon? We don't know. We don't know, let's not get excited about what it is called, but we know it has a root. That word is Megiddo, and we read about Megiddo in the scriptures, in the book of Chronicles, in the book of Kings. You read about Josiah, who was in the valley of Megiddo. Valley of Megiddo was a place where Josiah went out to meet with Nebo, uh, the pharaoh. Now, this is in 605 BC when uh, Nebo was going up to meet or fight against uh, the Assyrians or assist the Assyrians against the Babylonians, sorry. And Josiah wanted to hold him back and that is what he did. He went to fight against the Pharaoh, was killed there. Uh, there is also imagery of the Valley of Jehoshaphat. What is the Valley of Jehoshaphat? Jehoshaphat was surrounded by the Ammonites and the Moabites, just like Israel is going to be surrounded at that time. He had nowhere to look. He looked to the Lord. The Lord gave him deliverance, right? We have the imagery during the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was also surrounded by Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. He had nowhere to look. He looked up to the Lord. The Lord gave him divine deliverance. Regardless, all this imagery that we have talk about a place where the armies gather together. So the name Armageddon, we can get caught up in it and try to dig through and find ourselves in some weird, interesting places, but that is immaterial. What is important is a spot, it is a place, physical place surrounding the city of Jerusalem where the nations gather together with their armies to destroy the nation of Israel, to destroy Jerusalem, is it a mountain? Is it a valley? We don't know. But either way, it's in the vicinity. And the Lord brings them there, just like he prophesied in the book of Joel, just like he prophesied in the book of Zechariah. He brings them there so that he can judge them, so that he can give Israel the same experience they went through during Jehoshaphat, during Hezekiah. The same experience that they went through, he can give them, and that is an experience of divine deliverance. 
which was not because they were strong, because they did anything. The, the victory that Jehoshaphat had, the victory that Hezekiah had, both of them were without fighting. And that's exactly what's going to happen. The Lord is going to fight for them, and he is going to give them victory. And then the world is shaken, verse 17 onwards. The world is completely destroyed. The seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air. I'm reading verse 17. And a loud voice came out of the temple of the heaven, temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. The Lord is completely finished pouring out his wrath on the nations. There's going to be a huge destruction. I don't know how big a, an army would be standing up against Christ, but they all would be completely destroyed. There will be an utter destruction, and carcasses would be everywhere. Blood would be flowing everywhere, and this is when the Lord would ultimately destroy Satan and his powers, bind them for a thousand years, and usher in the millennium, and we'll read more about it later on. So if you don't mind, go through the questions, and we can review the questions next Sunday. Precious Lord our Father, we thank you. We thank you for the time that you give us to look into your scriptures and to understand uh, the great things that are there. We thank you, Father, um, that you are in control. And looking at these scripture portions all the way from the Old Testament, Father, you have woven such an amazing theme of redemption. And we thank you, Lord, that you are still the same, Lord. And we sing a new song in our life, and we thank you, we praise you for that. And we commit the rest of the morning into your hand. Bless us, Father, as we sit. In Jesus' name, amen.